thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. First of all, really, I want to get your reaction to these comments by Bezalel Smotrich. What did you make of them? Uh, I think that uh, that statement was shocking for many reasons, but let me point to two. Well, first of all, it's shocking that someone known for genocidal statements and someone who's also known for the jubilant, jubilant response to the recent violence unleashed against the occupied Palestinian population is allowed to deliver such a message in France at the heart of European Union, basically without real consequences other than words of condemnation. Um, the European Union has a legal framework that prohibits and demands states to punish racist and xenophobic inside public incitement. And in other cases, like in the case of uh, Russian propagandists' attacks against the identity of the Ukrainian people, um, political leaders, including US President Biden, have promptly warned against the risk of genocide and without getting into the material commission of genocide, international law uh, in, in, enshrines, uh, triggers the state's responsibilities to make the best efforts to, uh, to prevent the incitement to the commission of atrocity. Mm. But also, the other element that I find shocking is that this statement is not just another, yet another slip of tongue of an extravagant uh, minister. Um, these statements have been heard before, meaning the denial of the Palestinian as a people, and respond to something that we have seen in practice happening and consolidating, meaning the occupation is a denial of the existence of the Palestinian as a people. Uh, and, um, and therefore, the, uh, the, the apartheid is a tool to manage the problem. An, occupation, an occupied people who shouldn't be there is to be displaced and, and replaced. And, and like you said, Francesca, it's not a slip of the tongue. We've heard, a, you know, we've heard uh, incendiary comments from Smotrich before, uh, and these are far-right views, but he is part of a government, it's important to point out here, who was democratically elected. So what does this tell you about this Israeli government and what they stand for and what they want to achieve here? I think that this, this government is, um, is uh, triggering um, a huge uh, reaction among the, the Israeli people. But at the same time, I see, um, I see it as alarming, the fact that the Israeli public and the international community with it seems to be more concerned with the judicial reform within Israeli's domestic system rather than with the explicit genocidal rhetorics of its members vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. And this is not something new. And so we, what we have seen, uh, at least in the last 24 hours, we've seen Jordan, as you would have seen, Francesca, summoning the Israeli ambassador to Amman in response, of course, to that expanded map that we just saw of Israel displayed in the event in Paris. Uh, the EU, as you heard as well there from Borrell, calling on the Israeli government to kind of disavow his comments. And then we've heard the US say it utterly objects the comments. Is this condemnation enough, in your view, what more can be done? What can the UN do here? Um, ending the exceptionalism that is reserved to Israel, applying international law, which requires first and foremost accountability, because not uh, pursuing accountability has produced an environment of lawlessness in the case of, of Palestine, but also resorting to international law to put an end to the occupation because and the colonization, the presence of seven, 750,000 illegal settlers in the West Bank is and will continue to be the cause of, of tensions and violence and instability in the occupied territory. And can very briefly, I mean, we talked about what we heard from the US saying it utterly objects the comments. Are you disappointed by the US comments or, or an actions or lack thereof? Yes, I am. I've always been disappointed with US policies and politics vis-a-vis -vis the question of Israel-Palestine because, again, bypasses international law uh, in the name of uh, the preservation of the status quo, which is very convenient to the Israeli um, colonial occupation, I'm afraid. So what can the UN then, Francesca, do here in terms of applying pressure to the US? Is there any leverage <laughs> it's, here? It's very hard. It's, it's, but it's very hard. I mean, for me, the UN needs to take a solid stand because this is the Israeli-Palestinian 
question is not a bilateral issue. It continues to be treated as a, as a neighborly dispute, but in fact, it's a multilateral question and needs to be dealt with as such by the United Nations. But there is a schism, a, a sort of a disconnect between what the United Nations as generally a general assembly recognizes as wrong and condemned as wrong and what the UN has the capacity to do because the, the Security Council, which is critical to translate uh, and to enforce the law, is uh, paralyzed by US veto. Francesca, really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us here on the show. Francesca Albanese there from Tunis in Tunisia. Thank you.